So I'm going to go live. Press a live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Michelle Tricot. Michelle, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Michelle is the CEO and co-founder of Airbyte. She has been working in data engineering for the past 15 years. As head of integrations and, and engineering director at LiveRamp, he grew the team responsible for building and scaling the data ingestion and data distribution connectors, seeking hundreds of TBs every day. In 2020, he co-founded Airbyte, the new open source ELT standard for replicating data from applications, APIs, and databases. After only five months, Airbyte has raised $5.2 million in seed funding from Excel, Y Combinator, ABC, some high profile business angels. So far, 600 companies have synced data using Airbyte in the first six months. Michelle, that's very impressive. Uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you, Jason, for, for, for having me. Yeah, that's, uh, that's been a, a very uh, interesting past year and almost a half now. Uh, you know, we started uh, Airbyte with John early 2020, just before COVID started. Uh, started with a, a YC, uh, like all the, the YC story and had to do a, a pivot because the initial product we're working on was really uh, more like geared toward marketing and COVID did not do a lot of, uh, like a lot of the marketing teams got their budget frozen. So the product were unable to close anything at that point. And so we decided to pivot to Airbyte, as people know it today. And so far, it's been quite a, uh, like an interesting journey. Uh, we had a, our first release end of, uh, of, uh, end of September. And since then, like there, are, there is about like 1,600 companies that have used Airbyte to replicate data. So uh, like, I think here we can really see the, the power of open source and how much of a, of a problem it is for all these companies. So Michelle, how have, we, have you been able to convince these 600 companies to, to join your community? Do you have a marketing plan or like, how, how do you get, you know, so many companies so quickly? How did that work out for you? Yeah, so so basically, so it's, it's like six, 1,600. So, uh, but the, the thing here is we're building an open source software. So, and we're engineers, all of us. And at that point, I think we have, we understand like the need of, the persona that we represent. And we did a lot of uh, content marketing. So John, my, my co-founder uh, has a, a ton of experience doing so and providing a lot of guys, a lot of tutorials and really also giving like um, a very, um, like a peek into how the company works to everybody to inspire trust about like how we think about the project, how we think about commercialization, how we think about like designs and technical designs. And I think at that point, it's just, we talked to a lot of people and we realized that every single one of them has this problem. Uh, and at that point it's just, okay, want to try a bite, they try a bite. And after that, it's like word of mouth and people start uh, like using a bite. And we have, we have a public Slack and today we just, Two weeks ago, we hit a thousand members on uh, our public Slack. So very lively Slack channel, probably the biggest one on around data integration uh, today uh, online. So very, very happy about it. But it's really about the quality of, 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 of Airbyte, I would say. And, you know, one of the North Star that we have is it has to work. So of course it doesn't work all the time, but we're making it work as much as we can. <laughs> So Michelle, you're an open source company. For those who don't know, can you explain what open source is? And then why did you decide to go to open source and what are the advantages or disadvantages of being open source? Yeah, so open source means basically that we, we make sure that the code is available for anyone. And so we decided to go open source because there are already existing solution today. Uh, and when you look at, we, we interviewed around 50 companies that are using paid solution today. And 100% of them are both paying for a commercial closed source solution, but at the same time, they are building the same thing on the side. And there are a few reasons for that. So the first one is that the, 
they don't have control on the connectors. They cannot customize them to their own need. There are a lot of missing connectors. So when you're thinking about connectors, it's really all these little pieces of code that allows you to bring data wherever it is. So whether it's an API, whether it's a file, whether it's a database, and you have like thousands, tens of thousands of these. So it's impossible for a single company to manage, to manage 10,000 connectors or 20,000 connectors. And at that point, uh, when John and I were really investigating about, okay, how can we address that actual need and how can we solve this problem for all these companies that are redoing the same connectors over and over again, open source became like a, an obvious solution in a sense that now we can give people a platform on which they can develop their connectors, on which they can have access to existing connectors and without having to build them and maintain them themselves. Uh, so it's really a matter of like spreading the load of the maintenance, spreading the load of building and having access to high quality connectors through open source. Um, and yeah, and at that point, you know, we started with six connectors uh, when we first launched in a, in a, in September, and now we're we're about seventy connectors, and more than twenty percent have actually been contributed by the community, and we're putting more and more tools in place so that it is easier and easier for contributors to be on the project to add a new connector and to have the whole community to have access to it. So Mr. this might be a simplistic question, but how do you prevent someone coming and using an open source, like maybe putting bad code or messing it up or like doing something like wrong? How do you, how do you prevent that? Or is this, is that just a price of being open source? I mean, there is always a risk. Uh, at that point, we do review uh, connectors today. Uh, we're also going to have uh, more like, a, we have what we call, um, we have a, a label for, for connectors that are really maintained by Airbyte, also by the, by the community, but where we put a lot of, uh, we put a lot of attention to, and this will review every single uh, piece of code. Now, we are also um, reducing the risk of someone putting some malicious code into it by just isolating the functionality of a connector into a small container. So it means that if something wrong happens, it's going to be just for this particular source. And yeah, and, and at that point, it's easier to review the code. It's easier to track if something uh, malicious is being introduced into the code. But at the end, like everybody can review the code. And if they really want to know, I want to use this connector, let me do a quick audit. Uh, we try to limit how much code goes into a connector so that doing this audit is, is straightforward and in general, the pattern is always the same. It's like you learn how an API work, you're gonna do REST API calls or like uh, GraphQL uh, uh, calls, uh, or you're gonna to talk to a database. And if something bad is happening, you will see it. It's generally pretty transparent. So Marcel, I believe you got started in data integration like 15 years ago. What, yeah. what got you interested in, in this field of work? Um, that's, a, that's a good question, you know? I, okay, I think like data is, I'm a little bit of a data hoarder. When I was, <laughs> when I was, when I was younger, I had like all these, uh, these movies or things that I would sp store on my computer or music. Uh, and it's just like, yeah, you see that you can do a lot of things with all of that, whether it's like building your own uh, library of movies, your own library of uh, of um, of music, and when I started to work in, um, in 2007, I started in this company called Factset. So initially, when I joined, I was like, "Okay, this is finance, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And that's where I really learned about what is data and how you can actually make a, all a, a very smart process around how you collect data, how you process it, and how you distribute it. And that's really where I. I started to understand data, not just as something that I heard, but something more as a product. And, um, and yeah, and from there, I 
So basically over there, I, I did ingestion, I did distribution, I did all the processing and transformation in the middle. And then in 2011, I moved into Lyram. And here it was the same thing. It was really this company that was um, at the center of an ecosystem that was being created around ad tech and math tech. And at that point, you have like all this data that flows through all these pipes. And of course, someone needs to build this pipe, someone needs to maintain this pipe, and someone needs to make sure that this pipe can go everywhere. And I would say that's when I really got into not just the data management and the integration, but also about the scale of data management. Uh, you know, when I, when I left LiveRamp in, uh, in 2017, we were moving like hundreds of terabytes uh, every single day. And I, I think at that point, I, I feel like I have a very deep understanding of, yeah, the process necessary to build this connector and to maintain them, but also to scale them. And I know that every single company and with all the interviews we've done while, uh, like over the past few months, we know it's a problem that every single company has. Every single company is trying to solve internally because they have data everywhere. Data is siloed everywhere. So what can we do to just streamline this data movement and make sure that people don't have to, to build pipes or build monitoring of pipes and we can do it as they can have access to a, a solution right away. Michelle, is there a simple definition of, of data? A simple definition of data? Uh, I would say it's just a piece of information at that point. Uh, it's like you might have, and it doesn't have to be the, the full information, but it can be like partial information. So at that point, it's really a matter of like, what other piece of data you need to bring to get the full picture of the information or the insights you're looking for. And if you look in, at companies today, and even ourselves as individual, we have our data everywhere. We have data on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, all this data is somewhere. And what companies do at that point is they have the same problems. They have like their customers like billing, uh, HR, um, advertising, etc., and they want to take all these little pieces of partial information, bringing it all together so that they can get the full picture of the people they're working with, the, their customers, their employees. And that's when you need to have like all these little pipes that are de-siloing all this data, centralizing it so that people can now have access to the full picture. So Michelle, can you talk about the importance of data privacy and data security in today's age? Yep. And so what has, ha what has happened over the past few um, years is actually very good for, um, for, like, for individuals and for um, it's like giving, making sure that companies understand that they have um, like with GDPR and CCPA, making sure that company understand that they have a responsibility with that data. They have access to things that nobody else has and they need to be careful with how they process that data and what they do with it. And, you know, one, one of the, the features that we have in mind for, for Airbat around data security is really about, okay, you can bring all of the data like how do you make sure that you're not also importing data that is too sensitive to be made available for, uh, for analysis? Like whether it's a, a PII, a PHI, a social security number and all this information. And how can you build your pipes so that not only legally you're protected that you're not processing the wrong data and making decision on data that you should not have access to, but also that nobody can just bring data that is tainted by uh, like data that you should not have access to. Um, and that's the kind of thing we want to build on top of these pipes, like making these pipes smarter and giving you the confidence that once the data is there, you can use it and you can do it safely with respect to security and privacy. But this is like additional feature we want to add on top of these pipes. So Michelle, I know you have to have, I think it's called GDP, GDP or something like that. Is that, you think that's coming to the United States? And the second part of the question, is rules on data like different on different states and different countries or rules on data is the same everywhere? 
Yeah, so CCPA is, the, is something that is specific to California, but I think it's going to be more uh, general in the US. That's already starting. GDPR is more the rule for uh, Europe. There is one also in South America, and there is one also in Asia. Uh, and basically, all these rules try to encode how company should be using data. Like, what are the rules around uh, enriching the data? What are the rules around merging this data with other data sets? And just to make sure that people don't abuse um, the data that they have access to and that they make, and also that people who are providing that data by being either customers or users also have the control on how this data is being used. And that counts for CCPA, GDPR. Like people have the right to ask, I want my data to be deleted. I don't want you to be doing anything else with my data anymore. And, you know, that's where also with Airbyte being the ingestion pipes, we actually are the beginning of the value chain of that data. It means that suddenly we know where they, people are pulling data from. So we can create um, like a, an index of where all this data is located. So the day you get a request to delete the, the data or things like that, we can tell you, oh yeah, you, we have the, you have data for this user on this service, this service, this service, this service. This is where, what you should do to delete that data or like to just provide the data to your users. So Michelle, change the subject a little bit. Uh, you, you, you come just raise a 5.2 million C round. Can you talk about the process of raising that money? You know, any, and any, any lessons learned you can pass on, you can pass on. Yeah. So, you know, we've, we released the MVP of Airbytes, six connectors, very bare bone MVP, full refresh, only for getting the data. And at that point, we got in touch with many, uh, many investors. Um, and these investors, so first of all, we're not ready to talk with them at that time. Uh, we needed to make sure that we were getting some traction with the, the open source project and that we were getting some early contributors. And so what we did is we asked all of them, okay, let's meet in a week, uh, like I think it was November 15. And we started to schedule all these calls like two months down the line. And at that point, so John and I were, were very much about batching as much as we can so that, because raising money is important for your company, but it's also a distraction from uh, building the product. So what you want is to avoid having like, a, a meeting here, you work, a meeting there, you work, and then just having to recompose everything. So what we did with John is we put everything into one week. We had maybe 70 calls that week. Uh, that was a, a lot of fun. And, and yeah, and that's what we were really looking for was we need to find a VC that understands open source. We need to understand, to find a VC that can, that has the operational uh, infrastructure to help us on recruiting, uh, on uh, like intros, on like legal, et cetera, et cetera. And, but really the most important one that they need to understand open source. They need to understand that building a commercial product on top of open source takes time because first you need to build adoption. You need to build a community. There are a lot of things that go, come before you can start uh, go full throttle on commercialization. And that's uh, when we actually uh, talked to, uh, to Axel at that point. And yeah, we, when we were discussing with them, they really pushed our vision of the future the most. And that's when we, we really realized that we have like an amazing partner in front of us. And that uh, we, and at that point, we just moved forward with them. We, you know, we made up uh, slides that we use for the seed public. So everybody can have access to it, see what, how we did it. What did we show? How do, do, we, do we fit in the, 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 data infra, the data market and the data infrastructure? And yeah, that was, really, uh, that was really a fast experience, very intense, but very fast. And at that point, we went back to building Airbyte. So Michelle, so I think the biggest lesson from you is like, don't spread it over six months or a year, like, oh, yeah. like suck it up, so to speak, and do it within one or two weeks. Just yeah. suck it up, so to and speak. Exactly, 100%. Like, the more you can group things, 
the better and also you're going to be better because maybe you will have like the first few um uh the, fir the first few VCs that you're, you're going to mess up your initial slides, your, your initial presentation, just because you, you don't know if you're, if you're doing well with a VC, you might be able to just rehearse in front of friends and family, but a VC might be looking for something that you might not have uh, understood, or maybe your message is not clear enough. And doing batch allows you to do this very, very, very fast iteration on your slides, on your pitch, and yeah, and grouping is just, you save a lot of time. I would say that's the benefit of doing fundraising on Zoom is you can really do all of that uh, back to back almost. Um, yeah, and I, I kind of compare pitch decks to resumes, right? I, I, you know, I think if you show your resume to 25 different people, you get 25 different opinions. If you show your pitch deck to 25 different people, you get 25 different opinions. You just gotta like take the feedback and make the necessary changes, I think. And did you raise all your money in the Bay Area? Bay, was it focused on the Bay Area VCs or did you go outside the Bay Area? Um, so uh, yeah, most of it is from the from the Bay Area, yes. So, uh, and we also wanted to uh, surround ourselves with um, like successful um, entrepreneurs of in the data space. Uh, so we had my, my former CEO from uh, from LiveRamp. We had uh, a, a GM at Cloudera. We have the the CEO of uh, of Segment. But it's really people that that can really be that, that have a deep understanding of the industry. And I think it's important to surround yourself with people that know better and that have been successful so that they can sometimes guide you you know you're so sometimes you're so deep into your product that you might be missing some signals and having like uh, like uh, people that you can trust around you to just tell you oh look at this signal this one might be important for what you're building that is that is important uh, when you're doing your fundraising can you talk some about, about the importance of validating your idea as, a, as an entrepreneur and an early stage startup? Yeah. So, you know, the, so I really started, uh, so I left my, my job in uh, summer 2019 and during tw summer 2019 and uh, January, 2020, I iterated on a lot of ideas and that's also how John and I really appreciate working together and that's when we decided to um, to go together on this adventure but the thing is every single idea when you have it it looks good it looks amazing like you're gonna revolutionize the world and after 24 hours 48 hours just let it rest a little bit think about it let your brain do its work and after 24 hours, 48 hours, I can bet you that 90% of the idea that you have, you're going to say, oh, this was such a dumb idea. And I think this is the first filter you should apply to your ideas. Don't build something in 20 or 48 hours. Just let it rest because you, the excitement prevents you from being critical about your idea. And, and then it's at some point after that time, you yourself is going to be limiting. You, you cannot say this is an amazing idea you need to have some not some external validation but some external criticism uh, like critics and that's when you should be talking to people around you whether they are even if they are just your friend or your family like or like your former colleagues or current colleagues you need to get your idea to be challenged by other people because they will help you either like make it more precise they will they might help you see place where it can be more useful than what you're thinking about. Uh, and, and just take this information. And yeah, and, I've, and you know, what, what we're doing with, uh, with John when we were thinking about this idea is we would go on LinkedIn and we would talk, try to talk to as many people as possible on, on a particular idea, trying to find, okay, who is the person now that this idea is targeting? Uh, and we're looking more on B2B. So that's why LinkedIn was a great place for that. Um, like with the person, uh, what role would be interested? Who are the experts? And try to get in touch with them, get on a 15, 30 minutes call and just describe to them. 
And at that point, it becomes almost like pitching um, a VC, which is you want to have as many calls as you can, because at every single call, you're going to learn something, meaning that the next call, you will be, you will have better questions, you will have a better description of your idea, and you just iterate this way. And then at some point, you can just start putting up mock up together and show this is to so people can project into your idea. And, and so that's what we did. Uh, you know, initially in 2020, early 2020, what I was saying is we started with a project that was more geared to our marketing. It was getting a ton of traction. Then yes, COVID hit, all the marketing budget got frozen. And that's when we had to go back to the drawing board. But it was not just a blank drawing board. We had all these calls that we had before. So we knew that around data integration, there was something that was missing today in the market. And we just said, okay, let's take this thing that we've identified during all these calls and let's dig deeper into it. And let's talk to all the customers of these products and see what we can get, uh, what we can get as insights on to better inform how we should build that product. And so that's, that's what we did, but we really applied that framework for every single idea that we've uh, either validated or just discarded. I know one thing I learned when I did my, I, I, I did validate for my company is like when people started asking me questions, that's why I got the most valuable feedback because you can tell they're really interested in going on. So mm -hmm. next, let's talk about your co-founder. Can you talk about the process of finding a co-founder, how you two decided to work together and just, you know, they always say, you know, your co-founder, co-founder just like getting married again or married for the first time, right? I mean, it's a long-term relationship, you know, and, and everyone can be a co-founder. Can you talk about your process for doing that? Yeah. So actually, so John and I, we've known each other since uh, 2000, 2012 or 2013. Uh, our, actually, our wives, they used to work together. And so that's how we met. So over the year, so he started uh, three companies, was CEO in another company. And I was at LiveRamp, which was like going like through hyper growth. We went from like being a very small startup to uh, like public company. And we we're both like coaching each other in our careers. We tried to have like a few side projects together, but with his startup, with LiveRamp hyper growth, it was very, very hard to find the time to, to really dive into, the, into these ideas and to make them, to make them successful. And end of 2019. So I, I was doing all this brainstorm and I actually, it was one of the person I was talking to a lot, like on invalidating or validating ideas up to a point where we started to think about ideas together. And is uh, it, it, it was, at, it was uh, at the end of his experience for his, his last startup. And at that point we say, okay, we have very complementary skill set. So I'm very technical. I uh, and is very much on like the the marketing and uh, and DevOps uh, like Dev tool uh, profile and these two uh, profiles we work very well and so that's when we decided to to go in the adventure together. We don't always wanted to work together uh, over the past years, but that was the the moment where we were both at a point in our careers where we should just okay let's let's do it together and, and let's make it work. Michelle, can you talk about the points of people, whether developers or any, or any career field, on how to have thought projects? Um, so I would say it's, it is it is generally hard to have a side project if you have a day job because at at some point, what's going to happen is you're going to become so excited about your side project that it's going to take all your brain power. And it's going to be hard for you to stay motivated on your day job. And that's when it becomes very hard. If you want to make your side project a real project or like a, 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 a commercial project, there is a point where you really need to jump and say, okay, you know what? I stop my day job and I go full time on my side project because a side project, it is good, but you're going to hit your physical limits on working on something like that. And it's just, you need to be very clear about what you want from that side project. Is it just going to be a side project that you're going to work a little bit on, on the side or do you want to make it bigger? And if you want to make it bigger at that point, you need to really decide to, to jump into it and to make it, uh, uh, to make it a, a big 
thing. Um, but it's, it's always good to have this side project. I think it keeps your brain in activity. You know, sometimes in your day job, you might, um, you might feel like you're always doing the same thing or that you know too much or maybe you're not exploring enough or you're always in your comfort zone. A side project is a way of just starting to explore other uh, technologies or other ideas. And so I, I, I would say I encourage people to have side projects, just at some point you will have to make a choice or do you continue on the side project or do you stop it? Um, yes. Marcel, so whenever I have a guest on the podcast, you know, I do, of course, I do my research. And for you, there's an article that was written by you, I can't remember when, where you talk about blue ocean and red ocean strategy. Can you tell our listeners what is blue ocean and red ocean? So, say it again? Uh, can you t- so there's an article done on you where you talk about blue ocean and red ocean. Can you tell oh, our yeah. listeners what blue ocean and red ocean strategy is and that, how, that, how that helped you out? Yes. So basically, I forgot where that comes from. I mean, I can explain what it is, but I forgot the the exact root of this expression, but red red ascension means it's an ocean felt like with a lot of blood in it, meaning that you're going in an industry that has, or like a, a vertical or a product that has a ton, a ton of competitor. So basically everybody is fighting against each other. Thus, the 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 not a uh, blue ocean. So maybe like a uh, rest, so maybe like then a rest, the, so a restaurant industry would be like a red ocean then, right? Yeah, and exactly. Uh, restaurant, you said? Yes, restaurants. Uh, yes, although restaurants. Yes, yes, yes. That 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 works. That works. Yeah, for a restaurant, and and the blue ocean is more like you have a market that has very little competitors or no clear winner in it. And basically it's like, you have an ocean in front of you and you can go and you can swim. And, uh, and at that point, you know, you can think of data integration as potentially um, a red ocean, meaning that there are a lot of people in, um, in the space today. But when you're thinking about data integration in the context of open source, at that point, we are in a blue ocean. And we believe very strongly that you cannot solve data integration without being an open source project because just the amount of integration that you need to build is so large that it has to be work that is shared with the community. And at that point, that's why we consider that we are in a blue ocean because there is there is no real, there is almost nobody today that is a clear winner in the open source for data integration. And at that point, we, it, it just, it gives you more space to, uh, to expand. It gives you more like peace of mind when you're building. I mean, yes, there are other people that want to join this blue ocean, but I think you have like less concern than if you were in uh, a less blue ocean. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Jason? Yes, makes a lot of sense. Michelle, so how do you, how do you convince your investors that you are in blue ocean and not in the red ocean? Uh, so good question. And you know, I was talking to you about why I was saying like, we're looking for a VC that understands the power of open source, both in terms of the approach, but also in terms of the monetization. And at that point, like, and like getting people to understand that data integration, it is not possible. I mean, we can just show all the companies that are doing it in a commercial and closed source. And there is no clear winner. So they just have like some part of the market, but that, that's all. Whereas when we talk about open source, suddenly we can say, you know what? Anyone can actually create their own connector. They have a solution that is ready for them. They can just install on their infrastructure and boom, they have access to like a, a buffet of connectors and suddenly they can be smarter with data. And explaining like why open source makes sense here was not too hard uh, to convince because it does make sense, not possible for a company to do 10,000 connectors. And also in the space of data, data has always been a very good domain for open source. If you look at 
all the companies today, all the open source projects around data, I mean, they are generally dominant in, in their space, whether it's like Kafka, whether it's Spark, um, whether it's like um, uh, Airflow, or all these solutions, they are all open source. And it makes sense because open source gives you the flexibility. Every single organization has different needs around data. So you want to be able to take the best of breed and build your, your, your stack. And the way you can do it is through open source because open source gives you that flexibility. It's just until Airbyte, we're missing something for actually getting the data into your data stack and data infrastructure. Michelle, so back in 2011, you decided to move to the United States from, I believe, Paris, France. Can you talk about your, your decision-making process on that? Why come to the States? I mean, yes, I'm moving country is a big move, right? So what came, how did that come about? So it's, it, first of all, it's always something I wanted to, uh, to do, um, to go to the United States. I actually did a, an internship uh, in Princeton in 2000, um, 2007. Um, and this one was, this was around like medical data and like medical imaging. Uh, but yeah, I always wanted to do that. Uh, I had to go back to France for immigration reason, but in 2011, I was hitting a point in my career in France where I wanted to, I wanted to go like the volume of data that I wanted to work with were not yet available in France. And I, I really wanted to go, okay, where is this happening? Like you have like Facebook, you have Google, and you have all the companies that are gravitating around these like big data companies. And I was okay, going in the US would bring me to expand my skills even more. And, um, and that's how I, I came to, uh, to go to the United States. But ultimately it was always a, a goal in my, for, for, my, for my career, uh, just, I found a clear cut moment in France where, okay, I need to, to go to, uh, and move forward with that, with that, um, with that idea. And how, how often do you go back? Do you go back home to France? Uh, so it depends if you have a, a global pandemic or not normally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I haven't been back to France for like the past year and a half. Uh, so it's been a, it's been a long time. Um, but in general, so I have two kids uh and uh so we try to at least go to france uh with my wife like at least once a year uh so normally we should go there during the summer if everything goes well and how long is the flight from the bay area to paris uh 11 hours, 11 hours. Yeah. yeah but i i i have very very quiet kids and that's the, the moment when they are allowed to have access to the ipad for of as course. long as they they want <laughs> of course of course so next um you already talked about this some but can you talk more about uh the data integration landscape yeah so so in data integration so you have a you have a lot of closed source company you have uh you have five trend you have matillion you have stitch data um and you have, you have a lot more. You also have solutions that are uh, like AWS specific. AWS also has their own uh, data integration product. Google has the same. Uh, pretty sure Azure has, the, has, has something similar. It's just that when you look at all these solutions together, first of all, they have a lot of overlap with each other, meaning that they generally offer the same type of connector, but it's really about the long tail. Like, the long tail is inexistent in this is inexistent in this solution. Uh, but the, the, the problem is really that your data is everywhere. So you need to be able to connect to wherever it is. And that I would say that is the the that is what's missing with the existing uh, solution in data integration. Um, and also, I would say the landscape has also changed in terms of the persona. Uh, so if you look at what has happened over the past few years, like data warehouses have become extremely good at processing data and at being accessible for less technical users, but data savvy users. And suddenly what happened, so before it was more like the, the domain of data engineering and engineers. 
uh, now you have like data analysts, data scientists, analytics engineers who also want to be able to, who you want to empower to make better insights from data. And so at that point, what you need is to build solution that empower these roles. Um, and how do they, how can you empower them to bring the data without always involving an engineer? And that is, I think, what is changing today with uh, in the landscape of data integration is people, less technical users, more data savvy users want to have access to the data and desilo it. So how do you make that possible for them? So Michelle, you know, I looked through your LinkedIn profile and you, you post pretty much every day. Can you tell me why you, why you post every day and why it's important to and post on social media? Yeah. So, you know, we talk like open source starts with individual contributor, meaning how do you fix the problem for an individual? And at that point, we need to make sure that people around us and engineers and people on LinkedIn know about uh, like what we're doing and what are what problem we're solving and what options are available to them. And so that's why we need to have like a, some presence on, on social network to make sure that we can talk to individual contributors or small teams of there and make sure that they're aware that, that we are here and that there is a solution for the problem that they're that they have to, to solve today. Um, and yeah, it, it, is, it is also like whenever we, we, we post, so sometimes we repost articles that were written by other people, but sometimes we also talk about what we do internally. And, you know, as an open source project, we want to make sure that we are also involving the community in what we do as a company and try to be as open as possible about what we do. You know, for example, we've recently published uh, our company handbook. So basically everything that we do in the company from onboarding people to like how we organize meetings and to how we think about compensation and, and stock options and things like that, we've made all of that public. So anyone can look at it. And, you know, we're starting a community from scratch. And I think the secret to, to make it successful at that point is being very transparent with that community so that they understand what our motivations are and that Airbyte is uh, a good solution for them and they know where Airbyte is going and they know they have a, a say on everything. Uh, another way of like how we do this transparency is our Slack, our public Slack is actually also our internal Slack. So everything we do is on the public Slack. So every contributor can see how the engineering team is working with each other. Uh, we're asking questions to each other. Uh, so really inspiring uh, trust and, and, and confidence into, uh, into our bite. Yeah, I know Kevin said, we're going to be a transparent company too. I think the best example is like Buffer because I Buffer, everything's transparent Buffer. They even like, you know, record like Slack messages, emails, open source, you know. So yeah, I definitely think transparency is the way to go. So next, let's go back to your time at LiveRamp. Can you talk about the process and how you went about building, taking your team from 10 to 30 people? Yeah. So it really started. So what, when I started um, managing my, my initial team at Labyrinth, so initially it was like five people. And it's just the volume was small at the time. I mean, not as big as it, it, is, it is today. But what happened is, First of all, like the motivation for growing the team. First, the motivation are the product was becoming more and more successful. And meaning that there were more data flowing, meaning that suddenly we had to invest more into infrastructure and like changing how we were working with integrations. So we needed more, more people at that point to make sure that we can maintain like high quality pipes. Um, and the other one was also like the, how much, not just the volume, but also the use cases were changing. Meaning that suddenly people wanted to have access to more marketing and ad platform. So we had to add way more connectors. You know, 
we have like Lightroom had when I left like over a thousand type of connectors and was also like powering the product. So we are not building the pipes in a way that was too uh, specific to the product. They were like almost general purpose pipes. So it means that now when LiveRamp is putting, is creating additional product on top of it, they can reuse the same pipes. And it's just that at that point you have like a different scale, uh, different destination based on the product that LiveRamp is building. And for that, we, we needed to have um, like more like very strong engineer to help on getting this pipe to be extremely solid and to and to just work and like also how to design the process for building these connectors and to maintain them um so yeah it, i mean at that point it was really talking i mean i don't know it, it was really about making sure that we can deliver high quality pipes to the rest of the product and that that is basically why we had to to bring more people to the team and uh, yeah and just addresses all these new use cases or new type of product that were coming in so michelle back to transparency so how, what would you do in this situation like suppose i work for you right and i tell you hey michelle no this transparent stuff is good but i'm not com comfortable about being transparent about what i'm doing would you be like hey mm -hmm. jason we're going to work for you to try to get you more transparent or like or to be well jason we're a transparent company that's our culture and you have to go how do you work through yes. that that is that is a that's i think you put the, the finger on something important here which is the the culture that you put for your company is not just a pretty word on a wall it is really about what governs the people that you bring in and the people that you let go and i think the culture forces you to be opinionated about you, who you bring in and what kind of personality you're looking for. So if transparency is not good, then it means it's probably not the right company for you. And I would say that I'm pretty sure that Buffer, they made it very public that they are, um, that they are transparent. So it will bring profiles of people that love this idea. If you don't like it, you probably won't even be interested in it because you're like, oh no, I, I don't want to be transparent about anything I'm doing. So you're not even going to consider because you know that as a new individual, you cannot change like the foundation and the core of what makes the company. Um, so I, I, I think these are things where you cannot really compromise on. Uh, you need to be, yeah, you need to, to pick the people for which it work. And by advertising it, you're bringing in people that are interested in that. If you don't like it, you won't even consider it. That's a great point. Michelle, next, can you talk about the process of how you you and your co-founder or whoever deals with this builds out your product roadmap? Yeah, so, so it is, so we continue to talk to, uh, to users every single day um, and at that point, it's really a matter of first, what do we believe makes sense based on all these interviews? But it's also about what does the community uh, asks us? And you know, when we have sometimes we, we have like weird requirements that are coming from the from the community. And so in general, what we do is we we, we go on a call with them and we try to understand like what exactly is the problem that they are trying to solve. How does that fit with our overall roadmap? And is it something that is oddly specific or is it because it's not something that is properly supported by the platform or is it something very novel that they're asking for? And then we prioritize based on, okay, where do we want to go? What are our goals? And like, how does that feature fit into, into the roadmap? But it's really a mix between taking what we get from users, taking what we, we get from um, like our own experience and getting what we get from the, from the community, merging all this information and try to see how some are the same or synonymous, but not explained the same way and just, and, and just go from there. And there are things that we don't want to do. For example, sometimes people ask us like, oh, I want to do transformation. We want to be very vertical. 
meaning that we only want to focus on extract and load of the data and not transformation. There are systems that are very mature, very good at doing transformation. Like here, I'm thinking like just DBT is a very good example. And we don't want to be in that particular area. So that's, the, that's where we draw the limit of the, the product today. However, what we can do is, and that's something we're working on, which is people want to have DBT transformation that, that is perfect. We're just gonna make sure that Airbyte can integrate with DBT so that it can trigger the transformation on another system that, uh, that's gonna do it extremely well. So after that, it's yeah, our job to sort out what doesn't make sense and what we want to build. Yourself, and where are there other solutions? How often do you update or review your product roadmap? Um, every month and every quarter. So we have like general ideas, but you know, as a startup, you have to, to be reactive to these type of requirements because they might indicate something that the, the market is looking at. So I think we have like long-term objective, but it's really from quarter to quarter, sometimes things that we were planning for this quarter are gonna be moved to the next one because we realize that the source of this, uh, this planning was just an internal source. Like it was coming from us, but we realized that actually the community and our users want something different first. Um, and like typically you see, initially we're planning to do uh, a UI based um, uh, OS workflow. Uh, it was planned for Q1. And then we realized, okay, actually people require change data capture and CD, uh, they require CDC for database now instead of OS. So we just switched the two and we started to work on something that is providing value to people now, whereas the OS might have provided value, but maybe a little less than, uh, than CDC. But yeah, we readjust on a regular. So the name of your company, Airbyte, is that just some random name or does Airbyte actually stand for something or mean something? Uh, so it, I mean, it kind of means something. It's like a bite in the air. So because what we're doing is really about data movement and making sure that you, we can move data from one place to another, it's like having a bite in the air that is landing somewhere. So making bites more, um, uh, volatile and uh, movable, <laughs> but in the end, it's also about like what domains were available. Yeah, this the, one was a this one was a good one. <laughs> yeah, people don't realize how hard it is to get a name now, right? Because you have to you have to dot com dot io. Nobody on Facebook, Instagram. It's not like back in the day. You just picked a name, and now it's like yeah, a little bit harder nowadays. I think. Yeah. So Michelle, you already talked about your company, but you can, can you talk more detail about how the company got founded, why you started it, where is that right now, and what's your vision for the company moving forward? More moving forward. Yeah, so we're basically funded founded on January first at midnight, twenty twenty, um, and we the first thing we did was we went through the YC, uh, Y Combinator uh, program. And at that time we, so we always had this general problem space of data integration in mind. And when we did YC, that's how we applied to YC. So it was really the general problem space of data integration. Now, while we were at YC, we started to talk to more and more people, whether there were people from our batch or people from, uh, from outside that we are reaching out to on, on LinkedIn. And we started to orient ourselves toward marketing, data integration into marketing. And that is, as I was saying, like we're starting to get traction. We started to build a product. Uh, we're starting to get paid customer. Um, and yeah, and suddenly, with COVID and all the, the marketing budget being frozen, we, um, 
we realized that what we were building was a good to have. We are just giving more data to marketing people and maybe they don't care about having more data. They are maybe happy with the data they have today. Uh, and that's when John and I started to think about it. Like, do we want to build a good to have? Uh, like a product that just gives you a little bit more than what you already have, but is not really a game changer. And that's when, yes, we started to rethink about this idea and we went, okay, we know this problem exists, the data integration play, uh, piece. And at that point, we look at the 200 customers of existing solution. We try to reach out to all of them, that, like the one that were publicly available. We tried to reach out to all of them. We got in call with 50 of them. And that's when we really dug more into data integration on the technical side, engineering side. And that's when we realized, okay, this is the missing piece. And this is what we're going to be focusing on from now on. Um, and that was, that, was a, that was a pivot that we did in, uh, in July. And since then, yeah, we've been working 100% uh, of our time on it. Um, and then the rest is what, what we discussed, which is we released it, we did the fundraising, and now we're continuing to grow and grow uh, with more, uh, more users. And all, are all your clients in the United States, are there different countries? No, uh, I think 40% of our users are in the United States and the rest is spread across the world. We have a lot of people in Europe um, and uh, some of them also in Asia. So, so you recently closed your seed round. When do you have to start working on your A round? Is that like a, you have to do that 12 months, two years, or just when the money runs out, or what's the process on that? Um, so, I think it will really depend on, on the traction and um, the, the traction we continue to get and what we feel is, is good enough, is good for, for a Series A. Uh, one thing that we've been very clear on is we want to go through Series A with adoption metric, not revenue metric. So we want to show that we, because one thing that we want to do is really to become the standard for data integration. And you become the standard not by showing that you get revenue, but by showing that you get a huge adoption. Mm -hmm. And we want to get to Series A and show we're becoming the standard now. And these are the numbers that are proving that. And so that's that's what will uh, trigger um, uh, doing our Series A. Uh, now the yeah, that's that's what we'll trigger doing out the Series A. And, and now in terms of runway. You know, with 5.2 million, uh, we try to be very wise with how we spend uh, this money. So we have uh, we have some some good runway. Yeah, uh, one thing a lot of people don't realize when they raise money, like like 5.2 million, million is a lot of money. But then again, it's not because you got to pay salaries. You got the data is not free, cloud stuff's not free. So I mean, that money goes quickly unless you if you're not careful, right? Yep. Yeah, so we track we try we track that um, of course very uh, very thoroughly. So, what's your business model? How do you actually make money? Yeah, so we actually so first of all, let's think about the philosophy of how we're thinking about monetizing Airbyte. Um, as an open source project, we want to make sure that we solve the problem for individual contributors and very small teams. And the feature that we provide to individual contributors and small teams should always remain free. Um, now, everything, every feature that is built on top of that, that brings value to an organization or to a larger team is something that uh, we want to charge for. So at that point, it's really an open core model where you have some features that are helping organization here you can think about hosting and management you can think about um sso you can think about data quality data security and all of that which is very important for a larger organization but maybe not for an ic and this is what we want to be charging on so feature-based type of pricing um and so that is one one, one thing we have in mind the other one which is with airbyte having access to all of these connectors, it makes it so that a product 
that would want um, that would want to create a connectivity layer. So basically offering their own customers the ability to bring data into their product. That's another way we can monetize Airbyte, where we become like an OEM connectivity layer for any product. And if tomorrow you're, you're studying like an e-commerce analytics uh, website and product, instead of having to build your connector to Stripe, your connector to Richard, your connector to Shopify, your connector to Big Cartel, et cetera, et cetera. What if instead you just install Airbyte, the whole user experience is pulled into Airbyte and you can just start pulling data and you don't have to worry about connectors. You just care about is the data in my database so I can provide the right analytics. And that is really what we call like the, the, the power by Airbyte. Um, uh, product, which is yeah, becoming this OEM white label uh, connectivity layer. Michel, is there such a thing as a perfect customer for Airbyte? So, yes. Today, at our stage, it is data engineers and backend engineers that work with data because they suffer from having to build and maintain these connectors. They generally don't like doing it because that divert them from like working on actually extracting insights from data and doing something very smart with data. So we want to understand their problem a lot better and we want to help them solve it. Uh, and so, yes, that, that would be the one or like data scientists who wants to be empowered to move data. Uh, so all the people that are technical and that gravitate around moving data, are the, the and yeah and technical are the people we are we're looking to uh, to talk to. So Michelle, back to fundraising. Talk about this real fast, and I could be wrong about this, but it's like entrepreneurs before they raise funds, they have one set of challenges they have to walk through. And I'm gonna believe once you raise money, you have another set of challenges. You know, we're, we're saying more money, more problems. Can you talk about transitioning from one set of problems, challenges to the other set of challenges once you raise the money? Um. So I think that's also where when you when you do your when you do around like what partners are you working with? You know, you, you were saying that my co-founder is like my second uh, marriage. Uh, I think for your VC or your investors, you have a similar relationship, which is they're gonna be here until the end, the IPO, the exit of your company. And it needs to be, the expectation needs to be very clear and you should not shy away from saying no if you don't feel like the partner is aligned on what you, what you want and what you want for the, for the company. Because you know, like a 5% bias at the beginning in terms of how they understand the product is, is gonna create a lot of divergence in the future. And that's why, like, when we were talking with Axel, we wanted to, we really needed to find a partner that was extremely aligned on what we we're looking for. And Axel was, which is 2021 and is going purely on community. We are not going to focus on revenue. And we need to give ourselves the room to build this community and without having the pressure of the revenue right away. And so in a way, in a sense, we've kind of addressed a potential issue that we could have had after raising money by just picking the, the right partner. Um, and yeah, and after that, I, I would say for right now it, it is, it has been very positive for us because it also gives us an aura of, okay, Axel is a very good VC. So now we have an aura that uh, Axel is backing us. Uh, we have more money so we can hire more people. We also want to make sure that we don't hire too fast, too many people too fast. So we can keep the, the structure of the, of the culture right. But that is basically the, I, I wouldn't say today we're feeling that we have another set of problems. Like, I feel like it's business as usual. It's just that we get an additional perspective on on Airbyte, which is very valuable for us. 
So, Michelle, the entrepreneur, of course, your day is very busy, right? You have very competing responsibilities, different priorities. You know, you have a family, you know, you still have a life to live, stuff going on. How do you make sure you focus on what you need to focus on each day and not like waste time on like trivial matters? Yeah. That is, that's very interesting because I feel like it's a perpetual cycle where you start with like all these things you need to do. And some of those things you can actually, I, I don't need to do myself. There are someone in the team. There is someone in the team that will be better at doing them. So this person should, should do it instead. So it's really about how do you delegate some of the tasks and what are the, like, what brings the most value for the company now? But it's, it's, it's a perpetual cycle, which means that I might have solved one problem two months ago around my time. Now I have a new low hanging fruit that I need to fix. And it's always like that. It's just, as we grow, as we get more people, first of all, you get more people that can do things instead of you and that are gonna be better than you at doing it. And, and, and you discover like new type of problems. Uh, like how do we become better at following up with users? This is something today I want to do because um, it's just to, to create like this, uh, this trust between Airbyte and, and, and users. So really understanding like what kind of problems they're facing, how they're using Airbyte, because it also informs uh, how we should uh, create like how we should build the 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 roadmap, the product roadmap. So these are very important for. We have also have call of people who actually want us want to pay us because they want someone else than them to maintain Airbyte and to provide them with good SLAs and support. So these are important calls that I want to take today because they are like the the beginning of what could a commercial uh, product look like, and but I, I'm sure that if you ask me the same question in one year, I will tell you, okay, I still want to do this call, but maybe just for these particular customers. And maybe these ones, someone will do a better job than I am, that I would. Um, and it just, it, it changes all the time. And it, it just, you need to be aware that, yes, your time is extremely precious. And I feel like sometimes I don't get enough. So when I feel like, I, I'm blocked with my time. I try to say, okay, let's take a step a step back and look at all the things I'm doing during the day. What could someone else do instead of me? Whereas it would be better than me. And um, and let's focus and go deeper into these new these other tasks. So next, a two-part question: Like, there's some entrepreneurs, like of course Elon Musk, famously works 100 hours a week. Some people work 40 hours a week. I have a good friend he works. He works like 21 days straight, takes three days off. So how, what's your process for that? And then how do you take care of yourself as far as wellness? Yeah. So first of all, I, I mean, the good thing is I have a forcing function. I have a family. Uh, I want to make sure that uh, I spend time uh, with my wife and with my kids. So there is one day every week where I am completely disconnected. And I really, I mean, I'm not the only one. Uh, looking at it, but <laughs> I'm very, very careful about not breaking that rule. Uh, and I think at that point, it's just a matter of planning. Uh, you know, if suddenly I have an emergency and I need to go pick up my kids to school, that's going to be very hard because I probably have other meetings that are planned or like meeting with someone in the team. That is going to be very hard. But if I can make sure that the time I spend with my family or with my friend is on my calendar, then I, I'm going to organize myself around it. So it's really about planning and reserving your time for yourself. And so that you work, then your work uh, goes around it. Now, yeah, I mean, that's, it's been working pretty well so far. Uh, Sometimes, yes, of course, I've broken the rule a few, a few times, but uh, I try to, to be very careful not doing it too many times. <laughs> Michelle, is this something that I should have asked you that I have not asked you yet? 
Mm. Or oh, anything else you want to talk about? Maybe what what kind of people we are? Uh, maybe what kind of people we are we, we are looking for uh, in our bites? Uh, oh, that's okay. That's, that's a great one. So, what what when you hire people, what, what characteristics do you look for them? In? Yeah. So, and typically, you know, we were talking about what kind of task are taking a lot of time from me. And today, I try to have. So today we're putting a lot of emphasis on engineering because we are still in this phase where we are building the product and we need to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with like the best uh, team to execute and build, uh, to build the product. And because I'm an engineer, an engineer by training and I also want to make sure I save some time from the team from interviewing, I do many intro calls. Uh, some might say that I should probably not do it, but I feel like, at that point, the first filter that you get when you get candidate is already a pretty good filter. And you can see that on how the pass rate looks like uh, down the, the recruiting uh, pipeline, which is, which is pretty good. But what we're really looking is for is people that value, first of all, it's like, people who can be independent and can own the outcome. You know, that's one of the four values that we have for Airbyte, which is we want people that are not looking for people to tell them what to do. But instead, this is a goal that we have. You own that goal. Now you are empowered to make the choices you want to, to get to that goal. And whether it's by uh, hiring contractors, whether it's by um, like making technical decision, getting some time from someone else in the team, just having talk with some customers, like surveying the community, it, like almost like everybody, must, uh, everybody must have that uh, trait in them to, because first of all, I think it's very rewarding as an engineer or as uh, someone from uh, Airbyte's team to know that you own something completely and it is your responsibility to make it work. Uh, like you can touch to a lot of things. And you know, in startups, you have a lot of people who have this entrepreneur mindset that are joining that want to touch a little bit about everything that want to be very horizontal and have a lot of breath in what they do. And I think that's giving them uh, this, this ability. But to me, own the outcome is really the most important thing that I'm looking in people that I, I talk to. Um, and after that, it's also about, um, it's about humility and the ability to defend an idea, not because it's your own, but because it is what you firmly believe internally that it's probably the best idea. Uh, but it should not be because it's your idea. And um, that is something that is sometimes hard to find because people generally have a lot of ego. I mean, not everybody, but you have categories of people who have a lot of ego and they just want to push an idea because it's their idea. So they see that as a victory if the idea gets accepted. And But that's what trying to stay away from this type of profile or individual because nobody in the team is like that. And if someone, some, at some point you bring someone who is like that, that will break the balance that we have internally where suddenly people will have to be defensive instead of being very open and and um yeah and sometimes vulnerable about some ideas um so very careful about what we're bringing the team down michelle what advice do you have for new engineers so like you know just graduate college or maybe a coding academy they have like a role like limited portfolio limited github what advice do you have for them to find their first job? Um, yeah, and so you you know I think that is like COVID has made a lot of things very hard for a lot of people. I think for a new grad, it's made finding the first job harder than it was in the past because especially as we're all remote, like a lot of, I mean, now we're starting to go back to offices, but as a remote team, first of all, not that many companies know how to work remote. 
So it means that if you hire someone new, you want someone that knows more, that has more experience about how it, how, how to work with the team, how to work with stakeholders and things like that. And I think that at that time for junior people, it has made it harder for them to find a remote job because it's harder to mentor and it's harder to coach over Zoom. And they generally don't know what they don't know. Uh, and I would say here, now I'm talking from my perspective as an open source project. Uh, if, for, for Airbyte today, we're looking at junior people, but there need to be a very strong spotlight on something that they've done that makes us confident that they will be able to work efficiently remotely without us having to coach them so much. Uh, it's just because we don't, today we're too small to have the time to, to coach uh, uh, people who are just starting uh, to work. And so, some example here is, Yes, if you, if you take on a few tickets from Airbyte, that will put a lot of spotlight on you because now we can actually see how you work. We can see how you can ask questions if you have questions about the ticket without, and you show your independence. So I think these are the, the things we, we're looking for for, for for more junior people. It's like, are you able to work in independence and be autonomous? Are you able to own the outcome, even if it's a small ticket? Um, but a general advice, um, I mean, I would say it's the same. Like if you can show your, that you can be autonomous and that you can be independent, but you can know when to ask for help. If you can demonstrate that during an interview, I think you will have solved a lot of hurdle that you might have as a new grad in a COVID and remote world. And your company is remote now, right? Yes. And has, has, has it always been remote or the COVID that kind of forced you to go remote? I mean, basically, since we were starting in 2020 and the shutdown happened like mid March, we were not remote for maybe two months and a half. We were working out of a co working space, but at that point, yes, today we're fully remote. Uh, and yeah, we have, you know, we have people in San Francisco, we have people in Utah, we have people in Paris, we have people in Singapore, we have my co-founder right now is in uh, New Caledonia, a small island in the Pacific is gonna come back to uh, San Francisco uh, next year, but we're, we're, we're gonna have one person in London, we have one person in India. So we're already fully, fully remote today. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that we cannot see each other in offices. So, uh, I mean, I. I hope that at some point we have like enough people in some cities in the world that these people can just work two or three days a week into an office together so they get to know each other in person instead of over Zoom. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how we are today. Miss, uh, do you have a trick or two you use to like overcome the time zone differences through these various places? Um, I I'm going to say something obvious, but you need to be good at asynchronous decisions and asynchronous communication uh, because it is, we've hit a point where for us now it is impossible to have 100% of the team, the team together. It used to be, not anymore. So at that point is like, how do you make sure that you find the right uh, breaks so that Maybe sometime Europe is not there, but Asia is here and US is there. Sometime US is there, Europe is not there, but Asia is here. So what are all these combination by, uh, like I would say, we, we try to divide it by US, European and APAC. And what are the combination that makes it so that in one month, everybody can see each other. Uh, and for meetings where decisions need to happen, like how do you prepare these meetings? How do you make sure that people know what decision is going to be made? How do they know asynchronously what kind of uh, input they can provide? And then once the, the decision has been made, what led to that decision? And we're documenting almost everything we do today. Uh, um, and we try to have as many as this decision to be made asynchronously. 
So seems obvious, but it is hard because sometimes it adds a little bit of latency when you make a decision. But at the same time, you also use, you need to use your judgment. Do I need that latency? Do I need to pull everybody's opinion on this particular question or should I just do it with Europe or with APAC? But in the end, as long as I document how I made that decision, people know. And if there is something uh, that they want to add, they, they still can. Uh, and maybe we can revise, but it's like finding the right trade-off between the velocity you want for your decision and like how much people you want to be involved. Michelle, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I would say like the best place to reach out to us is on our Slack, slack.airbyte.io. Uh, That's probably the best place where you, all the team is there, all the community is there. We have our... Um, we have our uh, GitHub as well. So if you're using uh, Airbus, if you have questions about Airbus, you can ask them over there. But today our principal medium for communication is really Slack. And to our listeners, we have the link to all of those social media on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com. So Michelle, what kind of the end of our talk? Can you give us any advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Mm. Not really. It's, it was a it was a great conversation. <laughs> thanks, Michelle. Michelle, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jason. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day. <laughs>